chapter 20. We pick up in verse 17. It says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them... And so we left off with the disciples leaving the Sea of Galilee. They go down the Jordan River. They're down near the Dead Sea along the Jordan River. It says multitudes of people are following him. And it simply says that he healed them there. And so now he is crossing over the Jordan. He's going to go up to Jerusalem. And he's got like a week and a half, two weeks before he will be crucified. So they're going to make this journey up to Jerusalem. It says in verse 18, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. So this is the third time Jesus has told his disciples specifically what's going to happen when he goes to Jerusalem. He's going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He's going to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be mocked and beaten. He'll be whipped with the flagellum, the cat of nine tails. And then he will be put on the cross. So he's letting them know. Now, this is the first time out of the three times he's mentioned this that he mentions being scourged. Uh, scourging was one of the worst things you could do to somebody in the Roman Empire. They would take a, a whip, it had nine, they call, called it a cat of nine tails because it had nine leather straps coming off of this handle. They would tie pieces of metal and bone to it, and then they would begin to whip the prisoner who's ever guilty, what they think is guilty, and they'd whip him. And the thing about being scourged is if you told them what you did, you confessed your you know, crime, then they would stop whipping you with the flagellum. Well, Jesus, as I mentioned during communion, was led as a lamb to slaughter. He opened not his mouth. In other words, he didn't say a word. And so he would take all 39 lashes, 39 times 9, you can do the math. It's a lot of whips across his back. Most people, not most, many people would die just from the scourging. Because it would literally flay your back open. A lot of times your internal organs would be exposed. So Jesus is preparing his disciples for what lies ahead. And these guys do not understand what he is talking about. They understood crucifixion. They saw many people crucified. They understood scourging. That was what the Romans did. But they still don't believe that these things are going to happen to Jesus. They're still waiting for him to kick out the Romans set up his kingdom on earth and reign, rule and reign from Jerusalem. And so what's really going through their minds when Jesus tells them this is, oh yeah, we're going to go up to Jerusalem and you're going to kick out the Romans and we're going to rule and reign with you sitting on 12 thrones like you told us earlier. That's still in the future. That will happen during the millennial reign of Christ. But they're thinking it's not going to happen in the next week or so, Jesus being killed. They think he is going to set up his kingdom in a week or two. So he spells it out very clearly. This is going to happen. His death, his burial, his resurrection after three days. But they did not get it. But when the Lord tells us what's going to happen, and this is a prophecy, three times he's prophesying to them, this is what's going to happen when I go to Jerusalem. They didn't understand. When the Lord gives us prophecies, it's so that we won't be surprised at what happens in the future. When we get to Matthew 24, there's a lot of prophecies. Many have been fulfilled. Many are being fulfilled. Many more are going to be fulfilled in the near future. And so it's an exciting chapter. But we don't need to be surprised by the direction this world is going. You hear of wars and rumors of war? Oh, yeah, you mean like Ukraine? Yeah, there's going to be a lot more of that happening in the near future. So Jesus is about to fulfill the whole purpose for why he came from heaven to earth. He's about to be the lamb slaughtered for the sins of the world. He's going to be crucified on Passover because that's when the Passover lambs would be sacrificed. And so he's fulfilling all these Old Testament prophecies. When they come to Jerusalem... They will come over the Mount of Olives, and they'll look across a little ravine called the Kidron Valley. And the reason it's called the Kidron Valley is because Kidron means black. And it's the Black Valley because 
Josephus says that any particular Passover during this time frame, he was a Jewish historian, said over 250,000 lambs would be sacrificed on the Temple Mount. And when they were excavating areas in the Temple Mount, they found these literal gutters that would come off the end of the Temple Mount, drop the blood into the ravine. That's why it's called the Kidron Valley, the Black Valley, the Kidron Brook. It was black because of all the blood. So Jesus is going there. And so they're going to overlook this, and we'll look at that next time, Lord willing. Anyway, he is going there on purpose. Don't ever look at Jesus as a victim. This was all part of the Father's plan. This is the only way that human beings could be forgiven and cleansed of all of their sins. Again, this is the third time Jesus tells the twelve what's going to happen to him, and they are clueless. How do we know they're clueless? We'll look at these verses in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 31. This is the same scene we're looking at. It says, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. So he's about to fulfill a lot of Old Testament prophecies. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Notice, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. When do you think they finally understood? Well, it wasn't even after the resurrection, because 40 days after he rose from the dead, Jesus appeared to them over a 40-day period. And then as he's getting ready to ascend back up into heaven a week before Pentecost, they're still asking him, is it now you're going to establish the kingdom on earth? Is it now you're going to establish and rule and reign from Jerusalem? This is what he says to them in Acts 1 verse 7. It is not for you to know times or seasons which a father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, that means a living martyr to Jesus, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so we're at the end of the earth from when this was given. The Lord wants the word of God to go forth. He wants the gospel to go forth. It would be on the day of Pentecost when the light bulb comes on, because that's when the Holy Spirit would come upon them and fill them. And now they know why Jesus is leaving them there. While we're still here today, it's to proclaim the gospel message, to be witnesses of Jesus here in Grand Junction, here in Colorado. That's our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's why Mark is over in Africa right now. That's why Rachel's going to an unknown Un, well, unnamed Arab country. Uh, that's why we go to Northeast India. I mean, God's word is still going forth. Their focus would shift from ruling and reigning with Jesus to now sharing the gospel with as many people as we can because we want to see more people come into the kingdom. And that's the purpose. That's the focus of the body of Christ. That's what it should always be about, proclaiming the gospel to a lost and dying world. Because the gospel still is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe. Now it's interesting to me that every time Jesus speaks of his impending death on the cross, his suffering, the disciples focus more on themselves. So look at verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. Now when you look at the various accounts from Mark and Luke's gospel, we realize this woman is Salome. She's the mother of the apostles James and John. They were brothers and not only is she coming to Jesus, but we're told that they're with her when they come to Jesus. And they'll ask Jesus the same question as well. Again, Jesus is talking about the cross, and these guys are concerned about the crowns. They want to sit the closest to Jesus in his kingdom. So he turns to James and John, and he says in verse 22, Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. He's speaking to all three of them, the mom and the two boys. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we're able. Probably like, 
Uh, okay, yeah, we can do that. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. So, very important verses here. You know, they are ignorant of what Jesus is saying. When they say, Whoop, yeah, we're able to do this. They're totally ignorant of what he's asking. He even says, you do not know what you ask. And they were, they were clueless. Their answer is, you know, showing their ignorance. Yeah, we can do that. They don't know what the cup is. We'll look at this when we get into chapter 26, but the cup of Christ is drinking the wrath of God, drinking the judgment upon himself as he hangs on the cross and he shouts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was absorbing in his body the pain, the punishment, the penalty for our sins upon himself. That's the cup he would drink from. So they're clueless when they're asking Jesus this. In fact, Jesus struggled with this very concept. Matthew 26, verse 39, this is when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he is arrested. It says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He prayed that three times. The cup of God's wrath. He's praying, if there's any other way than me having to be separated from you, Father, on the cross, taking the sins of the world upon myself. He knew there was no other way. Not my will, but your will be done. He knew he was going to do this. He had to do this, and he was ready to go. But he knew that was the only way for sinful human beings to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be saved. He had to drink from that cup. So we had the privileges this morning partaking of a different cup that he now offers us, the cup of fellowship. That's why it's called communion. Communion means fellowship. He took the wrath as he drank the cup of God's righteous you know, indignation and judgment, and now he offers us the cup of fellowship. The baptism that Jesus speaks of here, it refers to his suffering. You know, baptism means to be immersed. So he is fully immersed in the suffering for our sins. So when his disciples say, yeah, we can do this, they have no idea what they're talking about. Again, verse 23, he says, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm about, I am about. baptized with, but to sit on my right hand on the left. It's not for me to decide. That's what the Father will decide. So he says, okay, you'll indeed face wrath. Not wrath from God. None of us are going to face the wrath of God. Jesus took the wrath upon himself. What we face is from the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the tribulations of this world that Jesus refers to. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Not the very wrath of God. That's something totally different. Paul says, much more than having been justified through his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. So he took the wrath in our place. And so he says, you're going to be judged. You're going to face suffering. And they did. James would be the first apostle to be put to death. In Acts chapter 12, King Herod Agrippa had his head cut off. And John, the last surviving apostle, he was a living martyr. I mean, he was dead to himself, but he lived for Christ. And he would be, history says they tried to boil him in oil just to make a statement to the Christians, this is what happens when you defy Rome, and it didn't even singe his body like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. So Domitian, the emperor, has him banished to the island of Patmos. What happened there? Well, you can read about it. It's the book of Revelation. That's why he was there, and that's why he tells us in Revelation 1, that's why I'm here, because of the word of the Lord. So verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. So this is kind of funny to me, because even before the church is born on the day of Pentecost, we have church division. <laughs> the ten are upset with the two. Why? Probably because they didn't think of it first. We should have asked Jesus first. We should have been the ones that sit on his right and left. But this is the only time we read of the ten and the two 
Every other time it says of the 12, the 12, or the 12 disciples, or the 12 apostles. And so the 10 are upset with the two. They had already forgotten what we saw last week in verse 16. Jesus said, the last will be first, and the first will be last. I mean, I can just picture Jesus thinking, oi vey, and these are the A apostles. These aren't even the B apostles. These guys are all messed up. So, verse 25, but when Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant." Again, the kingdom of God is just the opposite of the kingdoms of this world. The world says, lord it over others. You're the boss. You know, trample down anybody in your path. Climb your way to the top. Manipulate others if you have to. Do whatever it takes to succeed. That's not the Jesus style of leadership. It's just the opposite of the world. There's only one head over the body of Christ, and that's Jesus himself. The rest of us, we're just parts of the body. We're all under his authority. This is why we need to be careful with those so-called religious leaders out there, whether they call themselves pastors or prophets or evangelists or apostles. Be careful. Jesus is the final authority. His word is the final authority on all things that pertain to life and godliness, spiritual truth. Not what brother so-and-so claims that doesn't come from the Lord, but oh, I got this new revelation. No, phony Moroni gave a new revelation, and we have a temple being built in our town soon, which is unfortunate. Maybe we'll have the people from the Mormon Research Institute here to speak about that. Anyway... Be careful of those who claim to have spiritual authority over you. There's one who is the head, one mediator. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You go directly to Jesus when you pray. You don't go to Mary or some disciple or some saint or some pope or some priest or pastor, anybody, you go directly to Jesus Christ, one mediator. He's not too busy, as some people say. Oh, Jesus is so busy running the world. He doesn't have time for you, so you got to go through his mom. What? Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. He's a creator of the heavens and the earth. He holds everything together in the palm of his hand. He's got everything under control. He has time for you, and we'll see that in a moment as well. The Lord does not want any of us to lord it over anyone else. In fact, Jesus, you know, there's something he hates. He hates it when people lord it over other people. Revelation 2, verse 6. This is Jesus speaking to the church of Ephesus. First, he commends them for a lot of good things they're doing. And then he says, there's one thing I have against you. You left your first love, so remember where you've fallen. Repent, do the first works. And then he says this, Romans or Revelation 2, 6. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What were the deeds of the Nicolaitans? Nobody knows for sure, but their name kind of gives it away. Nikeo, the Greek word, there's two Greek words here, Nikeo and Laetis. Nikeo means to conquer or to be victorious over the shoe company Nike. That's their name. Nothing wrong with that. We're going to conquer. We're going to be victorious. Laetis, that's where we get the word for laity, the common person. He hates the deeds of those who lord it over, conquer, try to you know, manipulate just us common people. That's what he's referring to. Jesus hates it when people throw their weight around, they try to roughshod over others. Paul, who is a genuine apostle of Jesus Christ, says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. We stand in faith. Our faith and trust is in him alone, not in anybody else. The Apostle Peter learned this lesson very well. He writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. 
So he is a fellow elder. He's an apostle, but he's not lording it over these guys. I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He could have added who ran away from Jesus. But he says, also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. That's when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. The word shepherd there is poimano, where you get the word for pastor. Serving as overseers, episcopos, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And notice, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And so that is what a servant leader should look like. We're examples to the flock. We're to point people to Jesus and build them up in the faith. Lead by example. No doubt Peter is thinking as he's writing this back to when Jesus, after communion, he set up you know, communion. And then in John's gospel, it talks about he wanted to wash their feet. And Peter's like, no, you're never going to do that to me, Lord. And Jesus says, unless I do this, you have no part in this ministry, Peter. Okay, give me a bath. You know, it's like, no, your feet are dirty. You're clean, but you just need your feet washed. And so this is what we see. Jesus takes a towel. He begins washing the disciples' dirty feet. And he says to them in John 13, verses 14 and 15, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's very humbling to do this. Uh, last time Emily and I were in um, northeast India, we washed the feet of uh, one of the ladies there, um, Sanjoy's wife, and she was going through a lot. And as we're washing her feet, I mean, she was bawling. And they don't have the cleanest feet in northeast India. I mean, they just walk around nasty stuff all over the place. So, you, but you do it as under the Lord, and you just wash in. And, and when we before we washed all these former Muslim church planters and washing their feet, and as you're going around, they're just bawling their eyes out. And you know, it's like, what's this white guy doing this to me for? And you know, they try to put me on a pedestal. It's like, no, I'm just taller than you. That's the only difference. You know, it's okay. So washing their feet. And this one guy, it was funny. I, wish, I think we do have a video. We're not going to show it now. But so we're, we're, I'm, you know, on my knees, I'm washing his feet. And he just starts bawling. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, he died. His head goes right between my legs. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And he was grabbing on my legs. He wouldn't let go. And their guys are literally pulling him. And he's hanging onto my legs. And I'm like trying to hold back. And they, he's like flat, you know, stretched out. And he's like, dude relax. You know, I'm nothing because he was thinking I was something special and why would I do this? It's like, I'm nothing special. You're, we're on the same team here. Jesus is the head of the body, but it's amazing because it's very humbling to have your feet washed. Maybe we'll do that to some of your stinky feet one of these days. So he, for I have, then he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, learn to be the servant of all. Verse 27, he says, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. In verse 26, he uses the word diakonos, which means a minister servant. It's where we get the word for deacon. Here in verse 27, he uses a different word for slave. It's doulos. It's a willing slave. The apostle Paul describes himself as a doulos, a bond slave, bond servant of Jesus Christ, a willing slave. Paul gets this idea from Exodus chapter 21, where the Lord is instructing Moses on what to do with a slave. Slavery is nothing new. If a Jew went into debt with a fellow Jew, he became his slave for six years. And then after the six years, he was free to leave unless he loved his master. Look at this in Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6. But if the servant, I mean slave, plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. 
So you're all in here. And he shall serve him forever. In other words, he becomes a slave by choice. Pull out his ear. I don't know which one it is. can't remember. I know in our culture, one means something. Other than the other. But he'd pull out his ear, drive a nail into it. He'd put an earring on it. That meant he was a willing slave by choice. When Paul says things like this, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bond servant, literally means a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. He's saying, I'm a slave by choice, and my master is Jesus. He's the ultimate master. And why wouldn't Paul or any of us willingly submit, willingly serve Jesus as our master? You know the word Lord means master. So you say, my Lord and Savior, you're saying he's your master. And you have to be a slave to someone. Every single person in the world is a slave. The Apostle Paul is very clear about this in Romans 6. You're either a slave to Jesus in his righteousness, or, as many of us were, we were slaves to sin, slaves of this world. We belong to the kingdom of darkness. We've been transferred into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. But you are a slave. Bob Dylan sang it many years ago, and he was right. you got to serve somebody. It might be the Lord, it might be the devil, but you gotta serve somebody, right? Uh, I can't resist. I always say, don't try to imitate Bob Dylan. But that's the only way I can sing. I, only, I sing like Bob Dylan. I mean, I'm waiting for a new voice, so i sad. Anyway, this is opposite of the ways of the world. Jesus is the ultimate example. Notice in verse 27 again, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as, now the Lord says that a few times, just as, like remember in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loves the church. Oh, are you kidding me? Just as Jesus loves me? I, that's impossible. Yeah, it is, apart from Jesus working in you and working through you. The Holy Spirit gives you agape love. That's the love we're to have for our wives. Anyway, here he says, Be a slave, just as the Son of Man, Jesus speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus will never ask you to do something that he will not also enable you to do. He himself became a willing servant, a slave to his Father in heaven. It was in perfect obedience that he said, Okay, Father, I'll go down there and I will leave my glory behind. I'll be born in a barn. I will live the life you've called me to live. I will die. And here he says, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Mark 10, 45 is the same thing that Jesus says there. As the ultimate servant, Jesus gave everything to save sinners like us. He gave his very life. Now, a ransom was the price that was paid to deliver somebody from slavery or from prison. I was in both. I was a slave and I was in prison, spiritually speaking. We were prisoners who were sentenced to death for our sins. We were slaves who were in bondage because of our sins. And yet he paid the price in full to redeem us, to buy us, to purchase us out of bondage, out of imprisonment. The price he paid was his blood shed on the cross at Calvary. The Apostle Peter certainly understood this truth. He says in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, you're not redeemed with corruptible worldly things like silver or gold. You can't buy your way into heaven. Hey, God, if I give somebody a billion dollars, will you let me in? No. You can't buy your way in. You don't deserve it. You have to be purchased by His blood. From the, and He says, not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The greatest passage of Scripture that describes what Christ has done for us 
how he humbled himself, took on um, the form of a bond slave, and went to the cross for us. It's found in Philippians 2. This is known as the kenosis, where Jesus, God, came from heaven to earth, took on humanity, and it says in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, because he and the Father and the Holy Spirit are co-equal, but made himself of no reputation, taking on or taking the form of a bond servant, that's doulos, slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so in the case of Jesus, he's the greatest example of being a humble bond slave who did everything for the glory of his Father. And as a result, he has been exalted back into his place of glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. This is also why the Apostle Paul would tell believers in Corinth, you're not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. And this is why, 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought at a price. That was his blood. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belongs to God. Your spirit, soul, body, even your fleshly body, Belongs to the Lord. He purchased you body, soul, and spirit. He paid the price for you in full. That means your body is not your own anymore. You can't say like they would say back in the first century when you know these false teachers start showing up. Oh, the physical means nothing. It's all about the spiritual. So oh, if you want to drink and party and sleep around, that's okay. This body's going to die anyway. That was Gnosticism. They were living on a higher plane, they said. No, our bodies even belong to Jesus. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. He purchased you, and so we're to use our body, use our soul, our minds, and our spirit. We're to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We want God to be glorified in all that we do. After Paul says this, after you know he writes about Jesus being exalted, after humbling himself, both James and Peter will say in their letters, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In 1 Timothy 5, or 1 Peter 5, sorry, 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, it goes on to say, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so if we are all slaves, there can't be any better master than Jesus. He's the ultimate. He's the ultimate master, Lord, Savior. He is the one who alone loves us unconditionally. He alone paid the price to redeem us with his blood. He alone has accepted us. He alone has paid that price that we can never pay. He's the one that has turned us into new creations. He is the one who's preparing a place in glory for us. And he says, I'm going to come back again and receive you myself, that where I am there you'll be also. So, don't ever think of Jesus as a harsh taskmaster. He's not cracking the whip over your head, waiting for you to mess up. Before I got saved, I used to picture, because I was a baseball player, and I was like, if there's a God, I'm sure he's got a big baseball bat, and every time I mess up, he's going to smack me. And there's times, literally, when I would do something on the mound, I'd throw at a guy's head. I, I was just psycho. And I would do crazy things. I'd challenge guys to fight. I was much stupider then. So, I mean, I'd literally throw him at him person and I'd start yelling at him. There's times when I'd, I'd shake my fist at God on the mound. And I was waiting, kind of, like, if there's a God, he'll strike me down with lightning. He didn't, so that just made my heart even harder. And it wasn't until I hit my rock bottom that the Lord had grace and mercy for me. But he is so gentle. He's so patient. He is so kind. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And as a new creation in Christ, He loves us. 
and, and whom the Lord loves, he will discipline, but he's not whipping a, you know, cracking the whip over our heads for anything like that. He loves us. He's the ultimate servant leader. He gave his life as a ransom for many. So this final part, we'll go through this quickly. Matthew 20, it's a beautiful example of this fact. Look at verse 29. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And again, they go from Jericho. It's like five miles from the Jordan River. Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level. And then they'll climb up to Jerusalem, which is 2,500 feet above sea level. It's about 15 miles Going uphill, that's what they will do here. Verse 30, And behold, as they're coming to Jericho, behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. You know, here we're told there's two blind men. It's in Mark and Luke that we find out that one of these men is named Bartimaeus. You've heard of blind Bartimaeus. He's one of these two men. They're sitting on the road. They're begging. In Luke's gospel, we're told that when Bartimaeus hears this great multitude passing by, he says, what's going on? And somebody says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And when they hear that it's Jesus, they're thinking this might be our only shot at getting our eyesight. And so they start crying out. Everybody knows Jesus of Nazareth. He hasn't been doing anything in a corner. He's not doing this in secret. Three and a half years, he's been going all over Israel, healing people, touching people, you know, casting out demons, opening deaf ears, raising the dead, opening blind eyes. And they start yelling, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Now, when they say Son of David, that's the messianic title for, well, I just said it, the Messiah. That's a title for the Messiah. So they have more faith than the religious leaders who don't think Jesus is the Messiah. These guys believe he's the Messiah, and they also believe that if he is, we know what he can do. This is what the Old Testament says, Isaiah 35, starting in verse 5. It says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer. The tongue of the dumb shall sing. That's what I'm waiting for. For the water shall burst forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. Again, for three and a half years, he's been doing that very thing. Does Jesus still heal today? Yes, he does. Not everybody gets what they want, though. It's up to him. Like the Apostle Paul even said, Lord, please. He begged him three times, take this thorn in the flesh out of my sight. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Timothy, take a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments. God can heal. He certainly does, but he doesn't have to. He's God. We can't tell him what to do and how to do it. So the bottom line is Jesus did these things for three and a half years as a preview of what he's going to do for a thousand years when he comes back and sets up his kingdom. And that verse there in Isaiah 35 speaks of that. The leap like the deer... The water shall burst forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. That's going to happen. So here's blind Bartimaeus. He had better insight than most of the people there in Israel. Though he could not see physically, he could, by faith, understand what Jesus is all about. Look at verse 31. Then the multitude warned him that they should be quiet. Stop it! Quit yelling at Jesus. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. I mean, this is awesome. These guys will not be silenced. You thought cancel culture was something new in our generation? That's, that's what these, they're being told. Shut up! You can't talk to him that way. And he's like, the more they said, be silent, the more they said, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. I think there's a spiritual lesson in there for us. Don't be silenced, no matter what they say. You know, the world tries to cancel you. Speak up for what Jesus says. His word cannot be chained up. Even the Apostle Paul said that when he was in prison. The word of God cannot be chained, even though I'm in chains, but that's okay. Look at verse 32. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Now look at Mark chapter 10, verses 49 and 50. 
of the same scene, it says, So Jesus stood still and commanded him, Bartimaeus, to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. This is after they're telling him, Shut up, be quiet. Now they're saying, Be of good cheer, rise. He is calling you and throwing aside his garment. <laughs> he rose and came to Jesus. So here's this large group of people. They're just marching along. Thousands of people following Jesus. And can you imagine walking through that area? There's just a lot of dirt, a lot of dust, and they're just like a cloud of dust marching along. And, and it'd be hard to hear over thousands of people. They're just talking. You know how it is in you guys in between announcements. And I'm like, hey, time to start. And you guys are like ignoring me, you know. So you imagine thousands of people talking and just walking down with Jesus and then Jesus hears. <laughs> Have mercy on me, son of David. I mean, how loud are they screaming, but not too loud for Jesus. He hears them, and he stops. He calls them over. Amazing. Everyone else, they all, it's kind of a funny scene. They're all walking, and they just, you know, everybody's backing up and like an accordion crashing into each other. And what's going on here? What's he doing? Well, Jesus stops. What else would he do? He's never going to turn a deaf ear to anyone who is desperate, anybody who is hurting, anybody that's saying, Lord, have mercy on me. He won't. Even though they're blind, Jesus can certainly see and hear their faith. In fact, even though they were blind, they could see their need for Jesus. So when he says, what do you want me to do for you? Anytime Jesus asks somebody a question, don't ever think, well, doesn't he know? Well, no, he knows. He's God, but he always draws people out. He always wants us. That's why people say, well, why do we need to pray if he already knows everything I'm going to pray? Because he wants to hear from you. He created us for fellowship, communion. He just wants us to talk to him. He knows, but he wants to hear from us. He wants us to cast all of our cares on him, knowing that he cares for us. Finally, verse 34, so Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So before these guys could see Jesus, they hear him, and they felt his touch because he's touching their eyes. So the first thing they see when they open their eyes is Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I think everything else after that would be kind of a letdown. You guys have never seen a sunset. Check this out. Yeah, it's good. Jesus. I've seen the face of Jesus. Amazing. Some of you remember Fanny Crosby. She was an old hymn writer way back, a godly woman. She was born blind, and somebody said, aren't you bitter at God because you were born blind? And she says, no way. Imagine the first thing I see when my eyes are opened. Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what happened with these two guys. What did they do when they saw Jesus? Last thing they said, it says here is they followed him. I bet they followed him you know, the 15 miles up to Jerusalem. They probably see the Kidron Valley. They're probably part of the procession, which we call um, Palm Sunday. <laughs> we'll talk about that. You know what? Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we're actually going to be reading Palm Sunday in the Scriptures. That's crazy. Because I, I hate holidays in the sense that, you know, oh, i got to plan a special thing for it's a holiday. Mother's Day. Oh, man, what are we going to talk about? It's like, I don't, that's why I don't do topical stuff, but it's just, this is like the first time in 33 years. It's going to fall right in line. Praise the Lord. Anyway, back on track. You guys are like, it's time to get out of here. Yes. Um, but they follow Jesus. I want to, what do they see in Jesus over the next 10 days or so? He gets to Jerusalem. He's going to have his triumphal entry. End of the week, he's going to be crucified. Are they seeing all this? I mean, what an amazing thing for them to see. But they're following Jesus. They're on a whole new path, a whole new road with Jesus. Let me end with this. You know, what path are you on this morning? Are you following Jesus? Or are you following the ways of the world? Jesus says, we saw this, remember, way back, chapter 7, He's the narrow way, the narrow path. He's the door. That's why it's narrow, because He's the only way to life, eternal life, forgiveness of sin. 
Few are on that road. You're part of the few. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Broad is the gate. Many are on that road. Make sure you're on the right path with Jesus, that straight and narrow that he's laid out before you because he does love you and he has an amazing plan and purpose for you. Bartimaeus and his buddy here, I, I'm, I can't wait to see them in heaven and just to hear their story. I mean, there's so many characters here that just blow me away thinking of what God has done in them and through them. And we have an amazing story as well. He took us just the way we were, dead in our sins, dead to the things of God. He breathed the breath of life into us, and now we can be used for His glory. What a great master we serve.